Hello everybody and welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. Let's go ahead and keep going through the uh, Sembia series, Gateway to the Realms, whatever it's called. We're going to look at two books here, Sands of the Soul by Veronica Whitney Robinson and Heirs of Prophecy by Lisa Smedman. The short story for um, the Tazzy story and novel by Veronica Whitney Robinson. The story is fun. We get to learn a lot about Tazzy and the way that she operates. I think a lot of that was set up in Shamu's short story, which Tazzy was a huge player in as well. And that's something that I really like in general about these series overall is the way that they interact and you feel like all of the characters do belong in the same house, that, that, that they're not just shoehorned in, although it shows up... It, it, it kind of feels like it's shoehorned in in certain places. I'll get to one of those in a moment. But for the most part, it, it feels pretty organic, and that's nice because, like, for instance, both of these books, kind of one of my problems with it is they're immediately removed from Sembia in a way that makes it, you know, they could just be any character, not necessarily part of the Askevran household. And so I, I think that maybe detracts, but... On the other hand, I get that it probably would have been difficult to maneuver six or seven novels that were all taking place in the same place in the same time, interacting with all the same characters. I mean, that's got to be difficult. Like Shattered Mask, they essentially involve the entire family before the end, and that was really, really fun to read. But I get that you can't just keep doing that or else you've got a lot of overlap. The Sands of the Soul short story is really fun. Tazzy kind of learns that this guy who she always goes out with uh, on her wildings is actually paid by her father, and it's this big betrayal to her. I don't see why it would be. It's like, oh no, my dad cared about me, and I made a friend out of it. You know, I mean, it just seems kind of silly to me that she takes being upset as far as she does, but I guess she's a young girl or whatever. And the whole, the events of this story kind of lead up to, or lead into, I should say, the novel. Sands of the Soul, I'll admit it's been a while since I've read these, and I read them at the same time, and I had a real problem of getting things confused, because essentially they're both about strong, young, female characters going on this large quest to stop something horrible happening. Sands of the Soul, it's all about, I think her blind friend is going to be sacrificed to Char, or maybe her blind friend likes Char, and anyway, there's... A lot of, uh, there's a purple worm fight in the desert, <laughs> so that's kind of fun. It just felt like it went on for a really long time, and that's probably because the plots were similar enough that I just felt like I was reading one gigantic book with one gigantic uh, journey in both of them, so that was kind of annoying. I guess I had hoped that since Shadow's Witness really didn't go in at all to the Kale, Tazzy, unrequited love story... I, I wish that this had somewhat. I wish that that was addressed in some way, shape, or form. It really feels to me like, why was this in there if it wasn't going to play in in any way, you know? If, if it didn't mean anything, why bring it into play? And since Erebus is, of course, the kind of standout character, at least for me, it felt weird uh, that this never really got addressed more than it did. I'm not saying that anything that happened was bad or I felt cheated, but it, it just felt an odd choice as, a, as writers, and I wonder whose idea it was to put that in there. I don't necessarily have anything bad to say about this book, but I don't have much good to say about it either. I guess this book was frustrating in that sense because it really feels as if with the third edition stuff, people have more leeway to do a little bit more creative of stories, and this one just kind of played it safe for the most part. Nothing bad, but just nothing surprising. And it felt like, you know, I, I expected a little more. I expected a few more risks to be taken. Fundamentally, stylistically, or not stylistically, fundamentally, nuts and bolts wise, there's not much difference between this and, say, one of the uh, earlier uh, things like Escape from Undermountain. I mean, people have a quest, they try to get to the end, uh, things are thrown into their way. And I get that that's kind of what everything is, but some of our writers are much better at hiding it. <laughs> Veronica's writing isn't bad. I didn't find myself skimming because of bad writing, simply skimming to get to something that would happen. I, I was mildly curious about the way that it ended, mostly because I wanted to see if the Kale thing had any sort of uh, um, end to it in here. 
because I have read Midnight's Mask years and years ago, and I don't remember there being anything in there. Uh, so I thought maybe there would be some sort of closure to it in here. No such luck. Let's talk fairly briefly about Heirs of Prophecy. Basically the same thing that I've said about Sands of the Soul applies here, except twice over. The short story for it, I rather enjoyed, simply because nothing really happens in it, except that this girl, the, a chambermaid at the Escavron house, finds out that she's a half-elf. I don't think it's revealed until the book that she's actually Thamelon's bastard daughter, um, and that when he sired her, she's a twin, and that's the reason why she doesn't look really elfish at all, is because the other twin of that union looks way more elf, and so they're both half-elves, but one looks human and one looks elf, which, you know, I, sure, why not? That makes sense, right? So I really enjoyed the short story because it was very, it felt very slice of life. It was kind of about a young woman growing up and accepting herself and dealing with some self-image issues and dealing with, like, a lost crush and dealing with, you know, what uh, her spiritual journey, you know, how, how do I feel about faith, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then the book I just had all sorts of problems with. In a series where it really feels like they did a lot of work to, even if they were shoehorned in, make little moments stand out where you felt like, ah, this was... This follows upon that in that previous book, and da 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 Like, there's this moment in here that I thought it was the worst of the shoehorn moments, where essentially she meets Talbot, uh, the star of Black Wolf, and it's kind of like, oh, da 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 ha ha ha, I'm a werewolf, oh, I'm a half-elf, do 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 And it just, it, it felt like, it, it felt really dumb, and like one of those moments in a TV show where it's obvious a scene was written because the writers wanted to get two actors together, even though... There was no reason for that scene to exist, and it's like, okay, I can I can deal with that. My main problem here is it's like, well, you know that war that's been brewing with the elves for years, and it's like, what? You know, th th there's been no mention that I recall of any sort of tensions with the elves in the past books or the short stories. It just seems to come out of nowhere, and all of a sudden the main thrust of this book is the two bastard twins trying to save the world from, or trying to save the area from this war breaking out. And it's all about somebody trying to foment this war. And it just felt like maybe a few lines here and there about like, you know, well, those damn dirty elves or whatever. Oh, elf racism was common in this area. Da -da 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 -da. But as I say, I don't recall anything like that. So it just felt like it, not only that scene with Talbot was shoehorned in, but the entire plot was shoehorned into the series, and that totally didn't work for me. I'm not particularly fond of how, what would the word be, clericism is handled in this book. Um, it essentially seems to say, like, you know, clerics don't really get spells. Uh, clerics just, when they need something, they pray really hard and it happens. The end. And it's like, well, that, that's awesome, but... I you know, that's really powerful, I mean, and, and it, it feels like, you know, uh, you know, it's practically, it feels like at times, because the spells just keep increasing exponentially through this book, it seems, it feels like at times, if uh, Larigen just would have stopped and prayed really hard for peace in the land, it probably would have happened, and I guess it also feels like if your god is going to help you out through everything and kind of lead you from step A to step B almost to the point where you never need to do anything, then what the hell is the point of having humans who are clerics in the first place? I mean, it kind of makes evil gods make more sense in comparison. Uh, you know, Erebus becoming the chosen of Mask, it really feels like, okay, you get a couple of healing spells, but you know, if you screw up, you're dead, dude. You know, I chose you because you seem really good at what you're doing, uh, and um, I think you're going to last at least a couple of years, but I'm not going to bail you out every time you have a problem. Uh, that, to me, seems to make a lot more sense than Larigen just being like, man, I don't know what to do. Hey, uh, Haloon Salir, I, I can't remember the silly elf uh, name, but, you know, soon, hey, soon, um, this branch is a little high. I don't know how to get over it. Levitate! It, it kind of felt like that after a while. And I didn't really dig that. Again, not really a problem with the writing, per se, just uh, writing with some kind of mechanics in there, or a problem with some of the mechanics in there. Again, neither of these are bad books, but I can't really recommend either of them. I like Sands of the Soul a little bit better. 
So I'm hoping for something better, and, and I'm probably holding these to a bit of a high standard simply because of my excitement for the Erebus Kale stuff that's coming up. And now I'm really scared that I'm going to get to that and be like, man, this sucks as compared to what it was in my memory. Because you know how that can happen sometimes. We'll see, though. All right, next time, Lord of Stormweather. This is Michael T. Bradley, Realms Remembered.